So hello and welcome to Napoleon Revisited, Kirby's Fascinating History, um, our Windows in Time presentation presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I'm Carrie Tannehill, Head of Adult Services. This program is being recorded. Please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure a quality recording. The recording of today's program will be uploaded to the JCLS Beyond YouTube channel within two weeks. There will be time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Feel free to put them in the chat box, or you can also ask Paul directly at the end of the program when the recording is stopped. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's presenter is Paul Faddock. Paul is a former journalist turned author who spent his formative years in Kirby. Thank you for being with us today, Paul, and sharing your presentation. I will give it over to you. Thank you, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Now, granted, Kirby is obviously not the first place that comes to mind for most folks when pondering Oregon history. Beyond the boundaries of Josephine County, few Oregonians could find Kirby on a map, even if they had just driven through it. Never mind, it was once the county seat, once a feisty little burg brimming with vim and vigor. Sadly, most would describe it now as little more than a wide spot on Highway 99, 199 between Grants Pass and the coast. But I submit it remains an interesting and unique little place. Now, having said that, it is true that Oregon literature hasn't been kind to Kirby. Consider Suzanne of Kirbyville, a 1904 book written by Dennis Stovall. When I, when I read it in the mid 1960s, while a mediocre student in the eighth grade at Kirby Elementary School, I found the fictional love story based in Kirby syrupy at best. But, I was encouraged later that same year when I picked up a book called Travels with Charlie in Search of America, written by John Steinbeck and published in 1962. The book is about the famous writer's travels with his dog named Charlie. I fully expected Steinbeck to take the reader through Grants Pass and Kirby en route to California. Alas, he drove down the Oregon coast, completely missing historic Kirby. Now fast forward two decades. In 1982, Blue Highways, A Journey into America was published. A travel book written by William Least Heat Moon. It also held promise of a Kirby visit. Nope, nary a word about Kirby or its environs. Yet, I naively had great expectations for a local visit in Bill Bryson's 1989 book, The Lost Continent, Travels in Small Town America. Surely, his nearly 14,000 mile trip in search of America's hamlets would include Kirby. In fact, he didn't even reach the Beaver State and I was crestfallen. So, although I'm certainly not a writer on the level of the aforementioned authors, I am writing a book that centers around Kirby. The ten tentative title is Charlie and Suzanne Travel the Blue Highways Across the Lost Continent in Search of Kirby. Okay, the title needs a little work. In all seriousness, Kirby deserves historic recognition and respect, but I'll let you be the judge. Before I get further into my presentation, I want to thank Dennis Strayer, who volunteered for 24 years at the Kirbyville Museum and History Center for sharing his research on the historic Little Hamlet. Sadly, the remarkable historian died of cancer this past spring. He and the friendly volunteers at the museum have done a wonderful job in keeping local history alive. 
when you are driving through Kirby, be sure to stop at what I believe is the finest small town museum in, in Oregon. You will be impressed. While I'm thanking Dennis, I also need to thank Maureen Battistilla and Lee Webb for helping me with this presentation in terms of setting me up uh, in cyberspace. Uh, they will tell you that I'm somewhat of a Luddite. I, mean, I can find my way around Kirby, but, but not uh, with a computer. And when it comes to Kirby, I have to confess to being an outsider, having been born in the Metropolitan Grants Pass. But I spent the lion's share of my childhood in Kirby, starting with the second grade in 1958. As a local urchin, I frequently wandered the main street of Kirby with other young rascals, namely Cliff and Mike and Gary, and some other folks. And sometimes we caused a bit of mayhem and mischief. As far as I know, Dave wasn't among us at that point. Anyway. My maternal grandmother, Leela Ingersoll Cook, owned the historic Naki House, which is now part of the Kirbyville Museum grounds. And my cousins, Frank and Jack Cook, grew up in that historic house, which we will return to a little later. Oh, this is this is a photo of downtown Kirby back in around, um, gosh, uh, late 1800s. Uh, I'm sorry, 1908. If you look at the back, that mountain looming over eight dollar is eight dollar mountain, and if I recall, the story is that um, a miner wore out a pair of $8 shoes while searching for gold on that mountain. And I'm not sure if he ever found any, but um, over here to the, on the left side is what used to be the Kirby General Store when I was a kid that was owned by Kenny and uh, Helen Hazy, uh, Halliwell, a very nice couple. On the far left here is the uh, Woodman of the World Hall. You can see the wow up there. That building's now gone, as are most of the other buildings with the exception of the Oddfellows Hall here and uh, again, the, the old general store. Now, when I visit Kirby, I see memories of bygone days. My paternal grandparents, who had homesteaded in the Applegate Valley, sold their farm there and bought a farm in the Illinois Valley in 1920. My father, born in Ashland in 1906, grew to know many of the, many of the old timers in Kirby, the place his parents would shop in the early days. My parents met in the Illinois Valley when both were in their 30s and promptly made up for last time by having five children in three and a half years. That is uh, done by having two sets of twins 14 months apart. My twin and I were the, the youngest of the siblings. After my father lost his leg in a logging accident in the mid 1950s, we moved to Kirby where my dad built a small greenhouse and sold exotic plants, including orchids. Although he only had eight years of formal education, he was an avid reader and became a self-taught botanist. And by the way, the Suzanne of Kirbyville book that I mentioned earlier, that was one of the books in, in his uh, home library. Uh, now we didn't have a television, but we didn't need one. Friends and relatives would frequently drop by our small house. Now this, time of year in the evening, we would often gather in chairs under the trees behind the house and listen to old timers tell stories. The master storyteller, st storytellers included Johnny Vallon, a fellow who wore garters on his sleeves. 
Another one was A. Donnelly Barnes, who had a pencil thin mustache, and Roy Wells, who recited poetry, including those of Robert Service, the Bard of the North. It was a wonderful time, and again, we didn't need the television. And by the way, Johnny Vallon, back in the 1940s, was a Jackson County Commissioner, and Don Barnes was the County Sheriff. And again, they knew my dad when all of them wore the young men's clothes in the Illinois Valley. Now, as a youngster, I would sit on a folding chair and listen to their stories, happily munching on an apple from one of our trees or some Thompson seedless grapes from our arbor. When someone told a joke or a humorous anecdote, you could hear our dad's deep laughter a quarter of a mile away. I remember thinking that this was as good as it gets. More than 60 years later, I haven't changed my mind. And by the way, you could consider those sessions that we had, again, more than 60 years ago as Kirby's version of a Zoom meeting back in the day. Well, Tempest Fugit, time flies. So I better get back to this, uh, this program. Established in 1857, when Oregon was still a, a territory, Kirby is one of the oldest communities in the state. But keep in mind that Native Americans lived in the region for at least 8,000 years before the arrival of immigrants, most of whom were originally from Europe. According to Chelsea Rose at the Southern Oregon Historical, Southern Oregon University's Anthropology Department. Indigenous, indigenous people knew where the best places to live were, and we simply followed suit. Unlike Native Americans, we had a lust for gold, and it was a lure of gold that led to Kirby's creation. Now, most Historians disagree the discovery of gold in what is now Southwestern. Most historians agree the discovery of gold in what is now Southwest Oregon in 1851 launched Oregon's 1852 gold rush, bringing a swarm of miners who had failed to strike it rich in California's 1849 gold rush. But there is some debate over who should take credit for the Oregon discovery. Did you want to get some screen? Oh. What we do know for certain was that gold was discovered in 1851, about two miles west of Kirby on Josephine Creek at the mouth of Canyon Creek. It was also discovered in the winter of 1851-52 in a little stream in what is now Jacksonville, causing both communities to claim the gold medal in triggering what led thousands of miners streaming into the Oregon territory. Perhaps they should both share the credit or the blame, depending on your, your point of view. And this is a photo of the 4th of July celebration in the late 1800s, in Kirby, of course. And apparently back then, the community events include picnics, sports events, and parades. Here is a Kirby baseball team, 1903. The thing that I noticed about this that I found a little bit humorous was their hats indicated what their position was on the team. I assume SS was shortstop, C was center field, P was pitcher, and then 3B was third base. When Dave Atkin and I who's watching this right now, we're at Kirby Elementary School. We were known as the 
he, he will recall we were known as the Vikings. And I've always wondered why would they call the sports team the Vikings in Kirby, Oregon? You didn't see a lot of Viking ships uh, setting sail on the Illinois River. But I digress. The bottom line is that many of those miners settled in the region building homes and starting families and businesses. The first person to obtain a donation land claim in the Illinois Valley was James Kirby in 1854, who built both a ranch and a general store at the site now known as Kirby. In historical documents, his surname is generally spelled K-E-R-B-Y, but there are also an occasional K-E-R-B-E-Y. In any case, the boom town was first known as Kirbyville. When the po Kirbyville post office was opened in 1856, the second post office, by the way, to be established in Oregon, James Kirby was the first postmaster. Now, while the town of Kirby was taking root, the territorial legislature created Josephine County on January 22, 1856. The mining community known as Waldo at the southeast end of the Illinois Valley was the first county seat, but an election in June of 1857 resulted in Kirbyville resting away that title, a position it retained until upstart Grants Pass took over the county helm in 1883. Now back in Kirby, in the early spring of 1856, arrived Dr. Daniel Holton and his wife, Nancy. An Indiana native, the doctor quickly set up a medical practice. Now, when you visit the Kirbyville Museum, you can check out his surgery kit used for more than three decades beginning in the 1840s. It looks like something out of a medieval torture chamber. Painkiller, pshaw. A mere glance at the handsaw employed to amputate limbs is enough to cause incontinence. And don't even get me started on the little knife that he used to cut off fingers. Yo. But Dr. Holton did more than hack off limbs. When James Kirby got into financial trouble, Holton bought out the majority of his holdings. In late 1856, he donated land to build the first Kirby jail, a two-story affair with six jail, jail cells, including four on the first floor and two on the second floor. And the county sheriff's office was also in the building, which was torn down in 1893. By that time, of course, Grants Pass was a county seat and the, and the jail was, was moved into Grants Pass. But you know, you look at this old jail in this photo, it looks like it would, it would be hard to contain the, a house cat, let alone a, a, a someone that was a, a scofflaw. It looks like a whole bunch of termites holding hands is what probably held it together. But anyway, there was a large oak tree that's not pictured in this photo that was near the jail, which became known as the hanging tree. After that tree was worn out, another oak tree in front of what is now the Kirbyville Museum became the town's second hanging tree. Remember, this was a time back in a time when families attended hangings for entertainment. Yeah, it was, a, it was ghastly entertainment for sure. Let me take a drink of tea here real quick. I've got Kirby throat. Thank you for your patience. Now, on a lighter note, Dr. Holton was apparently a Francophile, a fellow who loved all things French. And according 
to the Oregon Geographic Names book. He was likely the one responsible for, for pushing through territory legislature in December, on December 18th, 1856, changing the name of Kirbyville of Kirbyville to Napoleon. The rationale for this is unclear, although I always like the quote attributed to him that all Josephines need a Napoleon. You understand that, that Napoleon Bonaparte's wife's name was Josephine. So. But Halton, who eventually moved to Merlin and became a member of the Oregon State Legislature, was no match for the Kirbyophiles. In 1860, the town's name was changed back to Kirbyville and over the years shortened to its current name. And by the way, I like the name Napoleon, but I can live with Kirby. After all, it is easier to spell. And again, going back to Kirby Elementary School, there are numerous teachers there like Don Orton and Marion um, Blackmore and others who can tell you that my spelling was atrocious at best. Okay, now the same year that Kirbyville was established in 1857, a wagon road was completed from Crescent City through Kirby en route to Jacksonville. During the gold rush, it was the main supply route for gold camps in the region. Being on the main thoroughfare, such as it was, Kirbyville thrived. Not only was it the county seat complete with the jail, it also had two hotels, two large stables, several saloons, a high school in the form of Kirby Union High School, and again, one of Oregon's earliest post offices. Remember, Grants Pass did not yet exist, nor did Medford and Ashland, although Jacksonville was flourishing and, the Jacks and was the Jackson County seat. So both Kirby and Jacksonville were the places to go for a night out on the town. This photo on the left shows the Pioneer Hotel. That was the largest hotel in Kirby. Further down is the um, Sawyer Hotel, which we'll get to here in a bit. In fact, the first hotel in Kirbyville was the Sawyer Hotel, built around 1858 by William and Agnes Uh, Agnes Sawyer, and this photo shows the, this is the Sawyer Hotel. Now in the spring of 1861, right after the Civil War started, Agnes Sawyer planted a broadleaf maple seedling next to the hotel, which became known as the Civil War tree. It was also called the Agnes Sawyer tree. The seven foot tall tree is still alive last last time I was out there on property which now houses the it's a burl which is a very fun place an interesting place to stop and, and check out and this is about a quarter mile north of the Kirbyville Museum immediately east of the highway. Sawyer's Hotel would have been a busy place considering the road from Crescent City was the the main, this is another shot of the, Sawyer, the Sawyer's Hotel. Um, and that looks like a rough crowd right there. Would have been interesting to go back in time to talk to those folks. But anyway, again, the Sawyer Hotel would have been a busy place considering the road from Crescent City was the main supply route for all of Southwest Oregon. Again, during that era, the Illinois Valley was the center of commerce in the county. The Sawyer Hotel served stagecoach passengers, folks traveling by horse and wagon, and others just 
hiking down the road. After Highway 199 was completed in 1926, the old hotel lost business to the more modern establishments. The Sawyer Hotel was demolished in, in the 1930s, but as I indicated, the historic tree was spared. But Agnes Sawyer is remembered for more than, than planting the tree. Hailing from Maine, the Sawyers supported the Union during the war. And there was a political division in the Illinois Valley where many pioneers and miners were from the South and actually held meetings supporting the Confederacy. Unable to find a Union flag locally, Agnes and their son cut and sewed cloth to make a Union flag, which they raised in Kirby on July 4th 1862. It was the first Union flag to fly in Josephine County. Little wonder the Sawyer Hotel became known as the Union Hotel. Now, among other interesting folks moving to Kirbyville when it was young were William and Nanny Naki, who left Bremen, Germany in 1855. After arriving at Ellis Island, they boarded another ship bound for San Francisco, where they started a restaurant and, and prospered. In the late 1870s, they boarded yet another ship, sailed north to Crescent City, where they took a stagecoach north, initially setting, settling in the Old House Mining District near Holland. And this would be a farming hamlet in the Illinois Valley not the land of wooden shoes, by the way. In 1880, the Nockies learned that the last remaining un undeveloped lot in Kirbyville would be available at a sheriff's tax auction. Now, William hopped on his horse and trotted over to Kirbyville where he was a high bidder at $5, which would be about $150 today. And he hired a carpenter to build what became known as the Naki House and moved his family, including five children, onto the roughly two acre parcel. And this is the Naki House. Now, I don't know what my grandmother paid for the property but I have no doubt it was more than five bucks. She was the last property, <coughs> excuse me, owner before it became part of the Kirbyville Museum in 1959. Now, since I've been talking about my grandmother, I should mention that my maternal grandfather was Ian Cook, who was named after his uncle, state treasurer when Oregon became a state in 1859. Now, what does that have to do with our story about Kirby? Absolutely nothing. I was just bragging about my maternal ancestry. Okay, returning once again to the subject at hand, the Nakis built a general store which was originally located west of the old Stagecoach Road, which is now Highway 199. But the store was inundated by flood water from the Illinois River the, the first winter. So the Nockies moved their store to where the south driveway to the museum meets the, the highway today. Like other general mercantiles of the, of the era, the store provided everything from flour to hammers to the local farmers and families who made the Illinois Valley their home. Now in this photograph of I.N. Delamater's general store in Kirby, circa 1880, you can check out what amounted to one day or one-stop shopping in those days. I mean, look at this place. Um, there's a head over here on the right and I can't tell if that is one of the employees or the head of a mannequin that apparently was uh, being offered for sale. Um, 
anyway, it looks like pretty tight quarters. And there's probably cracker barrels over here, pickle barrels, different things like that. Um, but you know, these were rough times. In 1874, John Delamater, the son of the store owner, was shot and killed while teaching at Sucker Creek School by a fellow named David Briggs. If I recall the story correctly, the, the animosity grew over a young lady that both were interested in. And I also recall, again, from the, the stories I read is that Mr. Briggs was hung um, on one of the, by, on one of the hanging trees there in Kirby. And incidentally, the Naki house, which has been restored by the museum board, included removal of the lead paint, including removal of the lead paint, is now on the National Register of Historic Places. And I believe it's also the only pioneer home that you can visit when, in Josephine County. That's open to the public. Now, um, this is the, this photo shows the um, dedication of the International or the Independent Order of Odd Fellows Hall in 1899. And I love the way these folks dress back then. I, I would love to have a, sort of a cowboy derby hat that this fellow has. Um, interesting looking folks. This building is one of the, the buildings that is still left as far as I know. Um, and has been in Kirby and has been restored by a local couple. And word has it that they're going to turn it into a pub. Now, of the Kirby residents I know, I believe all of them would be very enthusiastic about uh, attending that pub. So let's, let's hope that uh, comes to fruition. And the other building here is, as the sign indicates, the uh, 1907 Masonic Lodge building. Um, and the Masons are still uh, very much, uh, very active in the Illinois Valley. In fact, when my cousin Frank Cook passed away earlier this year, uh, the um, the memorial for him was done by his Mason brethren. And it was a very, very impressive uh, ceremony. Now, there is much more to Kirby history than what has been touched upon in this presentation. But you get the gist. It is a fascinating little burg that has left a very interesting historical legacy. Thank you for listening to me babble.